our speaker is Jenny Quinn. Um, Jenny is the president of the NAA, the Mathematical um, Association of America. And um, she is a professor at the University of Washington, Tacoma. Now, if you're familiar with Washington State, you probably know that it is rainy there a lot. And probably you would imagine that Jenny would spend the pandemic sitting inside in an office doing mathematics, not going out into the street, but you'd be wrong. Um, so the title of the talk is Always Look on the Sunny Side of Math. And I just have to mention that of all the people I have met during the pandemic, Jenny is the warmest and sunniest, truly. So I would call this the Jenny side of math. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. That was beautiful, Skana. Um, uh, thank you for including me in this amazing lineup. Uh, my brain is full to overflowing from the mathematical presentations thus far. And my hope is for this presentation to instead of filling your brain, to have it fill your heart. Martin Gardner, of course, has played uh, with complex mathematical ideas and made them fun and accessible to non-experts. His words and works have inspired many people here today to study math, magic, and more. Now this past year has been an exercise in patience, flexibility, and perseverance for all of us. Uh, G4G was postponed and then canceled. So damn you COVID. Um, but rather than sulking in the shadows, the organizers threw together this phenomenal week of presentations, spreading math joy and looking on the bright side of life. Dare I say, the sunny side of math. And in case you are not familiar, we are not at the Ritz-Carlton in Atlanta, sharing stories, flexing hexagons, or building mathematical sculptures. But we can virtually travel together to see three places and how they have, or they are, making math public and hopefully changing their communities for the better. Each one of these stories has a small pandemic element or a large pandemic element. And rather than wallowing in isolation, they each have chosen to appreciate the beauty, fun, play, love, and community. So for our first adventure, we're going to go from Atlanta, Georgia to Portland, Oregon, to visit Sunnyside Piazza uh, of the title of this talk. Sunnyside Piazza is the second of nearly 80 placemaking art installations in and around Portland, Oregon. And I visited it for the first time in 2003. I was on a job interview and the responsible host knew that I would appreciate this place. You can see on this Google Earth image that there is a large sunflower painted in the intersection. And if we move to the piazza itself, there are arbor, arbor installations on each corner. And there is this wonderful Cobb message board with bright embedded tiles. So what is it that makes this place so special? It was designed to bring community together. And you can see in this picture, it does just that. Uh, almost once a year, the community comes together to repaint the sunflower and refresh all of the public art in this, in this region, um, or almost annually. Uh, but more importantly, Sunnyside Piazza features Fibonacci numbers. So here you see a young girl counting the spirals in the intersection sunflower. And in this picture, I have them labeled uh, the, the spirals uh, that go in the clockwise direction. Uh, if you count those spirals, there are 13 of them. And if you count the ones that swoop in the counterclockwise direction, you can see that there are 21. 
13 and 21, of course, are two Fibonacci numbers. If we take a closer look at the message board itself, uh, you'll notice that those brightly colored tiles I previously mentioned are in fact the Fibonacci numbers, 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5. So each number is the sum of the previous two. And it continues on the opposite side, uh, going from 89 to 10,946. So just as a quick make sure everybody's with me, what would the next number be if there were, were to continue this sequence? And the star goes to Dan Bach for getting 17,000. 711 as the next number in the sequence, gotten by adding the last two, 6,765 to 10,946. There's one more interesting feature here. If you look on the back of this message board, uh, you will notice this decimal, 1.618398. One seven three five four, <clears throat> and when I saw this, I said, "Ah, that has got to be the golden ratio." Now you might wonder where these pictures come from. These are pictures I have drawn, and they take me a little while. Uh, so when I was drawing the picture, I was like, "I better be sure, just so I don't make a mistake." And I typed in to find out what whether it matched the golden ratio. And if you compare the numbers, uh, 1.618033988. So there in the ninth decimal place, they no longer match. I was a little disappointed. And one of the puzzles I want to leave you thinking about if you get bored with the rest of the talk, is what is this number? I'm not gonna tell you the answer yet, but if you have a question at the end, I might share. So that's a thought there. Um, all right, so I knew this place was special and I wanted to write about it. So I thought, hmm, maybe I'll write a Math Horizons article. Uh, and then I decided that was probably not ethical since I was co-editor with Art Benjamin at the time. Maybe I write something for MEA Focus. And then, you know, it just didn't feel special enough for me. This is a special place and it deserves to be recognized in a special way. So what I ended up doing was I wrote a book. Um, and you can see, the 30,000 feet view here of the first 65 pages. It's a middle grade, young adult, middle grade to young adult novel that features a 13 year old girl you see here. Her name is Phoebe. And Phoebe likes to solve puzzles. Just from this over the top view, what you might notice that this story is told uh, in narrative and in pictures. Uh, and it involves Sunnyside Piazza that we were just looking at in a fundamental way. Um, Phoebe uh, explores uh, the mess. She has a correspondence through the Sunnyside Piazza message board and explores the patterns and puzzles in the piazza and around Portland. And uh, if your eyes are really good or you can zoom in on your screen, you'll notice the first question she she answers or she engages with is the question you and I have already asked today, which is what's next? Uh, so it was just an open question on the board. She started to engage with. And over here in the, in the bottom right corner, you can see she said 89. So she did find that it was a Fibonacci number, but she had not yet seen the backside of the board. So there are puzzles throughout this story. Uh, you can see here's a Sudoku puzzle, here's a Kakuro puzzle, there are magic squares, there are magic words, 
And by magic words, I do mean squeamish ossifrage makes an appearance in the book which is of course from the 1977 RSA ciphertext challenge uh, in Martin Gardner's mathematical games column. Um, there is a mystery to unravel in her father's last letter home. And those of you with eagle eyes will say, huh, right here, that looks like a hexaflexagon. And you would be right. Um, honest, honesty here. Um, do you remember the hexaflexagon from a few years back that featured uh, Martin Gardner, Alice Through the Looking Glass, uh, maybe a Scott Kim designed logo, um, all those kinds of things. Uh, I loved that hexaflexagon and I was completely frustrated because it had six sides and I had a devil of a time finding all six. Um, so that really stuck with me and it plays a role in this story because this is also a hexa hexa flexagon. And part of, the, part of the issue is Phoebe must find all six sides. But the problem with the Martin Gardner hexaflexagon, if you looked at its flexing pattern, is it was sort of random which of the additional sides you found. And it wasn't until I um, found flexagon.net with all the flexing patterns of all the different variations of hexaflexagons that I could weave it properly into the story. So this is, in fact, Phoebe's hexaflexagon. And uh, thinking, of course, about Alice in Wonderland, there has to be caterpillars. So the first cycle is caterpillars go to butterflies, go to flowers, and back to caterpillars. Uh, and you can see from the flexing pattern, if you flex in the forward direction, you will add one side each with each discovery. So we will go from uh, from butterflies to spiders. Uh, we will go from spiders to phoenixes. And then finally, we will go to the final reveal of Phoebe's family separated around the world. And when you flex to the other side, they come together and hold hands in a heartwarming moment through the hexaflex again. Um, so I was absolutely thrilled to have this all work together. Uh, properly. Uh, I will say in designing hexaflexagons, it's really handy to know your wallpaper patterns um, because when I design them, I start with the wallpaper so that I, and at each point of the rotation, I, um, you can see what the flexagon will look like because it centers on the different points of rotation. So in fact, the phoenixes are a, a tiling of the, of the plane. Uh, and, and so there's their P3s and P3Ms and P6s and P6Ms. Uh, so there is some real thought and mathematics behind the design of the flexagon. Uh, if you would like, at the end of this talk, I will share a link with you and you can print it off and make it, uh, fold it, glue it, make it. Uh, and play with it. So um, that is our flexagon. Um, my hope is that I can get this book published. It, uh, I saw someone ask about the title. Uh, it is tentatively titled Phoebe and Blaze, A Pattern of Correspondence. Uh, and my goal is to get it into every middle school book fair so that young girls can learn it's cool to love puzzles and like math. Uh, I'd like to think that people will pick it up because it's beautiful. They'll read the story because it's compelling and they'll learn to love math without even realizing that's what they're doing. Uh, so near the start of the pandemic, Portland Public Utilities did some work in Sunnyside Piazza that required resurfacing the intersection. And as you can see, 
the design isn't here anymore. But the community has come together and they, they are recreating or they are putting a new intersection down. Um, but they decided to refresh it and had a design contest uh, and voted on which design would be uh, painted. I voted, I had a favorite, you have to know which one was my favorite. Uh, and as of October 1st of this month, you can see them here priming the intersection. They picked a different pattern. Uh, and I haven't been down and I can't tell from this intersection whether it still respects its mathematical roots or not. I'm hoping that maybe I just can't tell from a distance. So once this book is finally out, it will also preserve some of the mathematical history of Sunnyside Piazza. And that ends the tale of our first, first story, our first location. Um, so it, it helped me, this public mathematics inspired me to go beyond just appreciating it for myself. And by revealing it to the rest of the world, I want to inspire others and invite them into our beloved subject. For our next tale, uh, we are gonna travel south down uh, the Pacific coast to Oak Valley Middle School in San Diego, California. And this one truly is a pandemic story. I'd like to introduce you to Math Walks. Uh, you will notice that Math Walks started March, 2020. Uh, they continue to this day though perhaps not with the same frequency they started the pandemic with. And I need to introduce you to Tracy Jackson. Tracy is a math teacher at Oak Valley Middle School. She is a winner of the Museum of Math's uh, Rosenthal Prize for Innovation and Inspiration in Math Teaching. Um, and she is the best proselytizer of chalk puzzles in public uh, of the pandemic. Um, she has inspired so many people. Uh, and I love this quote from her. If I could leave a little bit of math on daily walks, I could not only give parents a way to incorporate some math, but maybe I could try and encourage math into curiosity, wonder, and problem solving, even just a little. Um, she has inspired more than just her own community. You can see her here chalking on, on the sidewalk. Um, she has more than 1,600 Twitter, Twitter followers. There is a math, um, there is a math walks Facebook group that has nearly 10,000 members. Um, she's inspired people around the world to follow suit. She credits people before her for the idea, but the trend really took off in the pandemic thanks to her really thoughtful posts. Um, the work has been translated and re reproduced in France and Germany, um, and she pulls material from a number of sources, uh, graph stories, uh, what's the same, what's different, um, which one doesn't belong, open middle math, she takes visual puzzles, she pulls things from art of problem solving. Uh, she will scour the world to find something that starts a conversation. Uh, what unifies all of these puzzles is that rarely are they looking for a single right answer. There are lots of entry points for the discussion. They can be very simple for the the young early learners, and they can be quite intense for the mathematicians. But what's important is that they foster a mathematical conversation. And uh, her, her inspiration, you can, you can follow her on Twitter. Uh, she is uh, at Tracy Teacher with hashtag MathWalk, or you can go to her Google site. And she links on her Google site, not only does she have her problem and her pictures, but she will link to where the problem comes from. So you can get more resources there as well.
but she, I directly credit Tracy as the inspiration for a group that I'm working with in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, we call ourselves hashtag Tacoma Math. Uh, we are part of the STEAM Learning Network of Graduate Tacoma. And our mission is to expand the equitable access and success in STEAM for all Tacoma students, particularly girls, students of color, and those impacted by poverty. So let's travel back north uh, to, to Tacoma, Washington this time, just a little bit north of Portland. And I want to take you to Dune Peninsula Park at Point Defiance. Now, I know someone's about to answer that, ask this, so I'm going to answer it before you even ask. Yes, it is named in honor of the Tacoma native Frank Herbert and his novel Dune. So perhaps you've heard of it. In fact, this movie is opening today, even though it was supposed to open in January. Dune Peninsula Park is built on the remains of the slag heap of the Arsarco smelter. It was one of the EPA's first Superfund sites. And recently, the city of Tacoma transformed this site, this polluted wasteland that inspired much of Herbert's environmentalism into a beautiful environment for everyone to enjoy, very much paralleling what the Fremen on Arrakis were doing with their planet in Dune. So felt it was very timely today to mention that. One of our chalk walks was hosted here. And here you can see many of the people who participate uh, as Tacoma Math. Um, we are college instructors. Uh, we have a retired engineer with the city of Tacoma. We have an instructional coach from Tacoma Public Schools. You can see us here in Dune Peninsula Park. We are at, at the edges of the Salish Sea. And behind us, you can even see Mount Rainier in the background. And the Arsarco uh, smelter was right here where there are now uh, beautiful hotels and, and uh, condos that cost more than my mortgage payment. So <laughs> it really has transformed quite a bit. But this park is well loved and well used by everyone in Tacoma. And the reason I, because we're trying to reach people uh, who don't live in my neighborhood, we decided to partner with Tacoma Parks and have events where we would do a whole walk around the park with eight puzzles for people to play with. Uh, and we would do it on a weekend or partner with a particular event. So we knew people would be coming to the park. And this particular walk I wanted to mention because uh, uh, this is a what's next kind of puzzle. It is a very popular sequence that is, a, that is attributed to John Conway. And while it is more popularly known as the look and say sequence, because of where we were, we called it the Salish see and say sequence. Uh, and as you can see, so we have one, 11, 21, 1,211, and so on. And the question was, what's next? Um, it is, I'm not going to give you the answer. You're welcome to write those down and think about them. Uh, if you really want the answer, it occurs in the online encyclopedia of integer sequences. Um, but I, I do want to say that we noticed something that Tiago mentioned earlier this week, namely that it's the young children who come in, jump into the problem and somehow make the connection. And it was wonderful watching them explain it to their parents afterwards. That as adults, we're a little bit too timid to, to have our conjectures, which are not well formed, exposed. And uh, we need to encourage more of that uh, exposure. Uh, Tacoma Math has done three of these events in the summer uh, in three different places. Uh, the, the first event we did was at Wapato Park, which is on the east side of Tacoma, much more in the 
neighborhood we're targeting, you want to target. And Wapato is just an absolutely beautiful lake with a one mile uh, walk around the lake. Uh, the community was so grateful as we were talking and fixing our truck problems, which we would come back about every 12 hours and, and sort of touch things up. They were just, they embraced it, they loved it, and they were thanking us so much for it. Um, and the problems don't have to be difficult. This is actually one of my favorites. Um, it's one of my favorites here because it's about lily pads. It's in front of lily pads. And so it's really making a connection to the community. Uh, and the problem, okay, the number of lily pads in the lake doubles every day. If it takes 17 days for lily pads to cover the lake, how many days does it take for lily pads to cover half the lake? And what is, um, I don't know if it's surprising or not, but it was fascinating, it was fascinating to hear families arguing over what the answer was. And it's that kind of conversation that we need to encourage. Um, so that was super fun and absolutely answers 42. I agree. Our final event was uh, just at the end of summer, uh, further a jump to the south on the star, here at the Star Center, rather than this, um, rather than this, uh, big top, uh, they brought in a, a, a inflatable movie screen and this was a movie night under the stars. So here people were coming uh, at about seven o'clock in the evening, picking out their location to watch the movie. Uh, and we were set up between where the movie was being shown and where all the food trucks were. So they would have to walk past us uh, and we would talk to them about our problems. They were also um, sort of stuck. They were there for like an hour before the movie started. So we were their entertainment and it was great, wonderful fun. Uh, here you can see we did a no right turn maze and uh, this young man who solved it, it took him a long time to solve it. Um, he went back, sat down with his family, and then he came back with his little brother and said, I have to show you this. Uh, so it was really lovely to see the, the joy being infectious. Uh, and rather than telling you about all the puzzles, I'm actually going to show you a video of the puzzles. Tacoma Math joined with Metro Parks for active fun and math puzzles before their movie Under the Stars. Let's review the puzzles in case you missed it. So there you have it. This is another of uh, Tacoma Math's outreach efforts is we make these little two to four minute videos that features a location in Tacoma and a math idea, or we'll recap a puzzle event. And this, um, this QR code here brings you to the entire playlist. Uh, so far we have 33 uh, of these videos. 
Um, and you can see from this episode synopsis, the location in Tacoma, uh, the math concepts that are being covered, and uh, we get inspiration from all sorts of places. Uh, sometimes, so the most recent one was tangent lines, which really was answering the question of which way does the bicycle go in honor of Global Math Week. We have ideas that we've taken from mud math fun facts. Uh, and then we have just puzzles for our early learners, which are to practice subitizing. Uh, and any of the presentations now that have stars on them, we have sort of an activity that you can do to complement the video. And we're trying to find ways to help educators use these either in their classrooms or after school to spread the joy of math. So that, my friends, are my stories. Um, what do each one of these stories have in common? Uh, they're bringing mathematics to the community, uh, some in less overt ways, but still very intentional. And each really could have been derailed by COVID, but instead made the conscious choice to positively promote mathematical ideas. And I'd like to leave you with these happy thoughts. Um, a good puzzle or a friendly conversation can go a long way to help others enjoy math. Uh, inspiration can come from many sources. And we have a tendency to keep the conversation amongst ourselves. And we really need to intentionally invite others in. Changing the culture around mathematics is going to take all of us. Uh, and the pandemic spurred an action to change the culture, uh, especially when we go start looking to the sunny side. I want to leave you with one last puzzle, which is one of uh, my pandemic puzzles. Uh, this came from May 2020 when we were novices at using Zoom. And the question, of course, is how does Zoom order the pictures on your screen? And the puzzle is here are four screenshots, one from each user. What order did they enter the room? <laughs> yes. So it can absolutely be done. And it was a super fun investigation through all of this pandemic to really try to answer that question. Applying a mathematical mindset, uh, you, can, you could have discovered a lot. Now, it is a moot point because in December of 2020, Zoom uh, pushed out an upgrade where you can now move people's pictures on your own screen so you're not forced into an ordering anymore. But I think it's still a fun question. Uh, and I have a final slide here. Uh, Skona has shared the URL. So this final slide has links to everything that uh, from this talk that I think you might be interested in. Um, so the hexa hexa flexagon is the one I designed and you're welcome to print off. Or you can go to flexagon.net. It is a fantastic resource. Um, a link to Tracy Jackson's a Math Walks blog, the video playlist from Tacoma Math and the episode synopsis. And then finally, if you want to go back and revisit the Zoom placement puzzle, you can do that. It occurs in the blog I have written math in the time of Corona. Uh, and I have also gathered all the posts about gather because I am a gather enthusiast. Uh, I, uh, I have been using gather for well over a year and uh, it talks about my trials and tribulations on using gather. So thank you so much for your attention. Wow, that was, that was so beautiful, really inspiring. If you can do that in Washington, I should be able to do it in Santa Barbara. So there've been several um, comments and some answers in the chat, but I first want to just mention what Ali Yoon is. From living in Portland, he was surprised that he'd never seen the um, golden ratio um, exhibit exhibit, I don't know if that's the right word, that you told, but he was aware of a place where mathematical constants are wrong, and that's in the um, Washington Park light rail station where pi is wrong. So <laughs> Portland, Portland has a reputation now. Um, so I will say that Sunnyside Piazza is at 
33rd and Yam Hill, if you want to find it. And if you would go and look to see what this new design is, I would be ever so appreciative. <laughs> I think there's more, lots more compliments than questions, which means your talk was really clear. <laughs> Strive for clarity. But we definitely, um, any information about, is the book all written? Last time I thought it was smaller. <laughs> right, so, um, so in fact, uh, I am happy to say that the narrative is all written. Uh, it, it has taken me eight years. This is a huge labor of love. Wow. Uh, I have drawn something on the order of 64 pictures and I have another 20 to do, but I am currently ready to find a literary agent. <laughs> okay, thank you everybody for coming and thank you again to Jenny for a fabulous talk.